by the members of the club. Mm. So they've set this display up. They have memorabilia in here. They have a video showing how their club operates and when they go on tours, what they do and how much fun it is. So, you know, this is something we give. It's our way of giving back to the automotive hobby. So if, if you're a member of a club, you have a national club, you want some presents, sign up for a six months uh, stay in this gallery and you get to curate it. And during that six months, you can even change the vehicles out once or twice if you want. And uh, just a good educational experience and sharing your hobby and your passion with the public. The AACA Museum has built its entire collection of approximately 200 vehicles through donations. And I'm here with one of our most important cars right now. This was actually the first donation ever received by the museum. It was donated before we even had a building or open to the public. It's an 1895 Chicago Motors Benton Harbor, Benton Harbor being the model. It's probably the only car ever built by the company. And it has the distinction of being the oldest documented surviving race car in America. Back in the days when this vehicle was built, there was no television, there were no electronics, there was no social media. When uh, a manufacturer wanted to focus or get public attention for their vehicle, they would typically enter in a race. And newspapers were one of the, one of the enterprises that, that sponsored some of these races. This was put together for a race to take place in 1895. It was finished in time, but did not make it to the actual race. Um, but maybe that's help, help, helped in its survival, who knows. Its top speed was about 25 miles per hour. And it has some really interesting features if you look at it. The steering wheel typically would be a circular wheel. In this era, it's a tiller, which is basically a straight bar. It has what I would call really primitive headlights. They're basically candles with some kind of a magnification system in them. And the exhaust system comes out the front rather than the back. So this would have been uh, with all the wind drag on it and the top bonnet and everything. It really was like a carriage with, with a motor instead of a horse. This car also has a distinction. Not only is it our first donated vehicle, it's number 20 in the documentation process by an independent organization called the Historic Vehicle Association. This group documents important vehicles in the history of America for the Department of the Interior. They photograph them from many different angles. They do sound recordings of the vehicles being operated. They basically document it from top to bottom. This car has the distinction of being the 20th car documented. And I think there are still well under 100 vehicles. So it's a very, very select honor that we're happy to uh, to have played a part in. And again, one of the oldest cars in America and the oldest documented race car in existence in the country. And donation number one at the AACA Museum. When you visit the AACA Museum, you take a cross-country journey over time. We uh, find ourselves here right now in Miami Beach in the 1930s. And uh, the museum's kind of been a victim of its own success. We used to have a changing exhibit gallery here. And then we lost that about six or seven years ago when we acquired the largest collection of Tucker automobiles and memorabilia in the, in the world. And that became one of our focuses in, in our exhibits. So rather than having one spot to put all of our temporary cars and, and displays together, we now disperse them throughout our different decades. At some point in the near future, we hope to put another 5,000 square foot wing on our building, which will then serve again as our temporary exhibit space. But for now, you'll find cars uh, from our different themed exhibits in different areas. And right now what we have here in Miami Beach in the 1930s, to my right, we have two beautiful Dodges from the 1950s. Both cars are Hemi powered as part of our Hemi exhibit that we've mentioned earlier. And then to my far right here, we have a DeSoto. DeSoto also has a first generation Hemi. A DeSoto, which is no longer being manufactured, was part of the Chrysler company. Back in the, uh, up until, up until actually a few, few years ago, most of the major car companies had multiple tiers of different brands that were priced differently to for different buyers. Uh, and now most cars are like Ford has Ford and Lincoln, they used to have Mercury, they used to have other brands. GM has gotten rid of Saturn and others and Oldsmobile and tightened it up. But back in the 50s and 60s there were multiple brands and this is an example of two brands from the Chrysler Corporation. And then to my left is a very very interesting car. I think it may be the first time we've ever had a Duesenberg in the museum. But Duesenberg is widely regarded as the most luxurious most affluent, most powerful, most spectacular American car ever made. made in, it was made in Indiana, Auburn Court and Duesenberg were all uh, kind of like sister companies and that's where the phrase it's a doozy comes from. It's really, it's really quite an automobile and uh, we're happy to have it here. It does not have a true Hemi engine but it does have what we call a semi-Hemi. It has a partial hemispherical head and it's one of the highlights of our, our temporary exhibit here in the 1930s in our Miami Beach scene. We are at our 1950s drive-in theater, which is one of the most fun spots in the, in the museum. 
playing in the background on our, our screen is the uh, introductory credit roll for the Tucker movie that came out in the 1980s. And we're going to see Tucker's a little bit later. You know, drive-ins are appropriate at a car museum because the two go hand in hand together so well. Cars and drive-ins, I mean, that's, that's why the drive-in theater was built in the 1930s. Giving people the, the ability to get out of, the, go, instead of going to a movie theater, they could get in their car, which is a personal thing. You didn't have to get dressed up. You could wear pajamas if you wanted. You could go and you could, you could see a movie at, at your own time and, and in your own, your own environment, so to speak, because your car is your personal sanctuary. So uh, drive-in theaters were, at one point, were spread all across the country. There were thousands of them. There's still quite a few left. Our, our theater here is uh, kind of a generic theater in the 50s, but our, drive -in, but our concession stand is actually um, based on a drive-in that really exists in Dillsburg called, called Harz. That's just down the street from us, about 45 minutes from the museum. Still in operation at this point, I believe. It's, it's a nice, cool place to take your kids or take your family or just take yourself for, for summer and, and go see a movie. Um, what we have behind me are a series of cars that are all European, and they're all what we call semi-hemis. They're, they're part of our temporary Hemi exhibit. You know, you normally would have this exhibit space full of 50s cars, appropriate for the 50s driving. But right now, they're mostly 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Alfa Romeos and MGs and other cars that have semi-Hemi engines, which are really cool and really neat. And they show the diversity of, of the Hemi engine across different brands, different size engines, not just V8s. It's, it's a cool part of our exhibit. And um, this space is, is a place that we use for a lot of different programs. We usually have a, a message up on the theater board. Right now we're playing a movie, as I said, but sometimes we talk about museum uh, membership, talking about we recruit volunteers, whatever the message may be. And, and we, we rely on a lot of different things here at the museum for our income. And we have a lot of corporate rentals and private events and, and weddings and so forth. And if you rent the space, you can actually have your own message, your own video, your own movie, whatever you want up on the screen to make your event a little bit more personal. So we try and, and cater to everyone and, and we're all encompassing and all welcoming at the museum. We have something for everyone here. So please come and check us out. We are nearing the end of our cross country journey. Right now we're in the 1960s and it, we're, the background is uh, Route 66. This is part of our Route 66 scene. We have some storefront build outs in a hotel and the wild area behind us is all hand painted murals on the wall. If you've noticed from some of our different spots, you know, we have murals in most of our backgrounds of our decade scenes. All these, these beautiful scenes are hand painted. They were here when we opened up in 2003. We've added some new ones since then, particularly our, our Hershey scene in the 20s. We try new things to keep the museum vibrant and, uh, and enticing and new when visitors come through. Two neat cars behind me. To my right is a 1966 Dodge Challenger. It's a 426 Hemi car, 425 horsepower. This car is uh, pretty much all original. The uh, owner who has it now, I think he's a, possibly the third owner. He inherited it from the uh, second owner. He has the entire history of the car. Never the engine's never been apart, never been repainted, never been restored. It's a, it's a really nice car. It's a time capsule. It's a good way to uh, study the, the era, how the cars were put together, what they were all about. Just a beautiful, beautiful car. And then to my left is another car that I mentioned a little bit earlier. I talked about some of the variety of Hemis we have here. They're not just big block muscle cars. Hemis refer to more than just V8 engines. They refer to hemispherical combustion chambers. And the car on my left is the one I talked about earlier. This is uh, it's not the official movie car, but this is a sim same model. It's a 1965 Aston Martin DB5. Similar car to what James Bond drove in the first Bond movie to come out with Sean Connery back in the 60s. So uh, not what you think of as a Hemi car, but just a really neat piece. And it fits in really well here side by side with everything else. Hi, we are right now at our last stage of our cross-country journey. We're in our 1970s scene, and it features California's Golden Gate Bridge. And it's beautifully, beautifully painted on the wall, a mural backdrop. This is our largest one in the museum, and it depicts the bridge totally empty, which I understand is something that you would probably never uh, happen to, to, uh, to come upon unless there was a major accident or emergency, because that place is typically packed. Um, five cars behind me, they represent a total of probably over 2,000 horsepower. If you go through every one of them, all of them have V8 engines. To my left, we have a Roadrunner, followed by a Belvedere. Both have 426 Hemi engines, delivering over 425 horsepower. At least that's what they're rated at. Could be more. After that, we have a brand new 2019, or almost brand new 2019 Challenger, which has astronomical power, as well as a fuel economy and safety. And to his right is kind of something you wouldn't expect to see in a Hemi exhibit. It's a 1970 Boss 429 Mustang. The 429 engine has hemispherical heads, and it was, it was what they call homologated in that era, meaning 
it was a NASCAR racer, but Ford or any other manufacturer had to make a certain number of examples for sale to the public before that car could then be sanctioned for racing duty. So that's a Boss Ford 29, only several hundred copies were made. That's a high horsepower car. To its right is a uh, Chrysler 300D. It's one of two cars that Chrysler made. Considered a factory car, but it's a factory performance car. It, they, they did a couple of things to the engine to make it a little bit more, more uh, performance oriented. They lightened it a little bit. And uh, during that era, which in the late 50s, American car manufacturers were banned from motorsports competition for a certain period of time. And uh, to get around that, they didn't actually race this car. They took it out on, on places like the, salt flat, the Bonneville Salt Flats, and they raced it for land speed records. And this car to the right, the far right, is a holder of two land speed records. I think it happened in 1958 when the car was new. So like I said, just a, a beautiful uh, way to, to end your cross-country journey here at the museum with a whole, tr a whole series of five high horsepower, high performance, hemispherically powered cars. The AAC Museum has come to have the reputation as being known as the center of the Tucker universe. If, uh, if you're familiar with Tuckers, you know what they are, you'll, you'll, you'll love it here. And if you've never heard of a Tucker, you'll come in and you'll learn a lot and you'll go away with a new respect and, and maybe a, a love of the car as well. Uh, Preston Tucker was an entrepreneur, a businessman, and during World War II he made a fortune, not a fortune, but he, he was successful in the armament business. And when the war ended, you know, car, car manufacturer has, had, manufacturers had converted over to wartime production during the war effort. And it took them a while to get back into the production mode after the war finally uh, concluded. And uh, he started a brand new car. He wanted a brand new car from the ground up. And he did that and introduced the Tucker 48, the 1948 model. 51 were made. And um, his goal was to do something evolutionary. He wanted a car that was economical, powerful, fast, and safe. And he found out really quickly that you can't have all those things in one package and produce a car that was also affordable. You know, the, the safety wasn't a big concern in the late 40s, and uh, he had a car with, sa with safety belts. And his, uh, his marketing people said, if you put a car safety belt in your car, no one will buy it because they'll automatically think it's unsafe, which is, which is just a radical thought to think of today when now when you have multiple airbags and all kinds of other uh, innovations to protect the driver and protect people in a car. Uh, but Tucker wanted everything. He wanted four-wheel disc brakes, he wanted an independent suspension, he wanted crash zones and crumple zones and, and all these things, pop-out windshields, all these things that would make the car safe. And he came kind of close, he produced a really neat, innovative car. 51 were made, and we have the, the world's largest collection here, thanks to, thanks to David Kamak of Virginia and the Kamak family. David Kamak started collecting these cars back in the 70s when they weren't million dollar cars like they are now. He was able to acquire three of them, plus a test chassis, uh, engines, factory blueprints, anything Tucker related, and he left all that to the museum. This space here was provided by his family, it's a 5,000 square foot gallery. It was our previous temporary exhibition space. When David passed away, the family turned all his materials over to the museum, and we built this gallery in his memory. And the family supports us annually, and it's a really good partnership, and it makes us the leader in Tucker automobiles in the world and memorabilia, and we just have all kinds of neat things here related to Tucker, including a car, right behind me we have a whole series. We have a test chassis, the red car is from a movie some of you may have seen called Tucker, The Man in His Dream, it came out, Dreams, it came out in 1987 starring Jeff Bridges, produced by Francis Ford Coppola. Behind it are two more Tuckers, one is the only one in existence with an automatic transmission, and we also have Tucker number one, which is behind me to the left, out of sight. Basically anything Tucker, it's here at the museum, it's open to the public, and it's a great way to learn about a really neat period of American history when one man had a dream and tried to build his own car. As I mentioned earlier, Preston Tucker wanted to build a perfect car and he put a lot of attention into all the details and as you travel through this 5,000 square foot gallery you'll see a lot of his efforts. You'll, you'll see bits and pieces of the brake systems that he wanted to employ or actually did employ. The suspension, the, uh, we, with the test chassis we have here, people actually drove us around in the parking lot of the factory to test some of the different systems and components. He really put a lot of time in, into R&D, development and engineering. He wanted a really, really safe car. One of the things that did actually make it to production and has become the, uh, a Tucker trademark is the uh, Cyclops steering wheel. The Cyclops, excuse me, Cyclops headlight. The, uh, the car had crumple zones in the front. So the design was if you uh, were in an accident or an impending accident, you would duck down and you would dive into the front, which is the front area up here because it's a rear-mounted engine car. And the feature the driver has here 
Cyclops headlight is designed to move with a steering wheel. So you have two lights that stay still and one headlight in the center that rotates with your car as you travel from left to right. That way you're theoretically you're not out, ever outrunning your headlights. So that's one of the neat safety features that made it to production. Another neat feature that made it into the actual car is a pop-out windshield. The front windshield glass would pop out upon impact at a certain speed, thereby protecting the driver from going through the front being hurt or having the glass come back and hurt, hurt the driver or the occupants of the car. Some other neat things we have here, we have a complete row of, of uh, engines that Tucker went through. He had all kinds of different plans, different things he wanted to do. At one point he was toying with the idea of putting an air-cooled helicopter engine in, in the vehicle so it would have much more power and efficiency. Ended up he found something he kind of liked. He ended up buying his own engine company and they made engines. And he, uh, had the, he had the old B-29 plant that was used from World War II as his production factory and he uh, incorporated some of that together. He converted engines from a company he bought to fill his, his, uh, his car, his car run of 51 uh, Tuckers. But the museum the gallery here has all kinds of bits of technology that show the different things he was interested in, things he was actually able to employ and put in the cars, the things he wanted to do in the car he was hoping to build. So, great place to explore and you can uh, put yourself behind the wheel of a Tucker and have a great time while you're doing it. The NTAACA Museum in Hershey has three floors with 70,000 square feet of exhibit space for you to see when you come visit us. We finished up a lot of the, the top floor, the main floor, we come down to our lower level gallery space here, which is the exact same size as the main floor upstairs. Throughout this space, you'll find a whole bunch of neat things. For example, we have a restored 1941 Valentine Diner that was done all by volunteers. Volunteers restored this entire thing after it was donated to the museum, brought it in here on two big forklifts, and we opened it up to the public. It's a really gorgeous, gorgeous piece. Also have a train room. Uh, all kinds of neat things that are, are activated by by sensors and you can go through there and bring your children. It's, it's good for adults too. It's, it's all trained, trained material, different gauges, different layouts, and it's all, uh, again, all taken care of by our, our great volunteer corps we have here. We have about 250 to 300 volunteers that help us with everything related to the museum. Also have a lower level motorcycle gallery and in that right now we have a mini bike display. Just opened a couple weeks ago. Mini bikes of all sizes, shapes, colors, you name it. It's, mini bike, it's called mini bike mania for a reason. Another neat thing we have here where are you going to go to find full-size buses? People are usually shocked when they come down here and find that we have at least 10 full-size buses, including the one behind me right now. We have a really neat group here called the Museum of Bus Transportation. They're part of our organization. They specialize in collecting buses, actual full-size buses that are donated and interpreting them through the history of, of uh, bus transportation in America. We're proud to have a bus similar to one that was used in the movie Speed with Keanu Reeves. And behind me is the actual bus that was used in the movie Forrest Gump. If you remember the movie, there's a scene in Washington, D.C. where Forrest, in his military uniform, confronts his girlfriend, Jenny, on the bus during a demonstration with the Black Panthers. And this is the bus where Tom Hanks as Forrest Gump and the whole scene took place. Just a really, really cool piece. It's, it's one of our star vehicles we have here. We also have a couple other things that qualify as, as Hollywood or star vehicles. We have a, come here in season, we have a separate building. It's not part of the museum, it's a separate tour. It's a storage building located behind our facility. And in season, we will open this up for a specialty tour. We'll take you around the campus. We'll tell you about why we're here and what we do, what our plans are for the future. And then a volunteer will take you through this building where we have up to 70 to 75 more vehicles of all shapes and sizes. And two of the vehicles that are in that building right now are Whitney Houston's Rolls-Royce limousine and Betty White's actual car. She has a Cadillac, a 1977 Cadillac Seville that was purchased for her by her husband. She actually used the car for a number of years. It was... Uh, donated by her to a pet charity for auction purposes because she was very big on, on supporting those kind of organizations. A collector bought the vehicle at auction, donated it to the museum. I remember years ago when it came in, we contacted Betty and we asked her through her agent if she would come here and dedicate the car. We got a very nice letter back saying, we're sorry Betty White's too busy to come here right now, but she wishes you well and she wants to let you know that that her car is called Parakeet. She named every car she had. It was a, it's a green Cadillac. She named it Parakeet. And she was thrilled that Parakeet had a permanent home and was in good hands. So come to the museum sometime. See our storage facility. You can see Forrest Gump here in the museum. And you can see Betty White's Parakeet in our storage facility. We've given you a real small sample of what there is to see and do here at the AAC Museum in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We'd love to have you come visit us. If you like cars, you're going to have a lot of things, a lot of fun, a lot of things to see and do. If you don't like cars, I think you're still going to have a good time. Please check us out on our website, www.aacamuseum.org. 
for a list of our hours, upcoming exhibits, and other changes. And please, come see us at Hershey. Thanks for visiting with us today.